with all the very latest from around the world. And here at home now, it's the ITV News at 10. An absolutely terrifying attack by a man wielding a sword early this morning in London. He's going to people's gardens, man. Lock your doors! Lock your doors! Put his foot on my foot so I couldn't back off. And then that's when he like drew out the sword. And it was, it was, it was arm's length. It was honestly petrifying. The same witness described her horror as she watched a 14-year-old boy on his way to school being attacked and ultimately killed. Also on News at 10 tonight. Trump finally blinks first after being threatened with jail. The former president appears to be complying tonight with a judge's order to take down his attacks on prosecutors and witnesses. High five. High five. Yalla. Yalla. Another heartbreaking account of the immense pain and suffering of Gaza's children. Pro-Palestinian protests intensify on American campuses and... Is it all over for the Great British Lawn? And you can see the contrast between how we used to mow it and how it is now with the longer grass, the wilder flowers, things like this cowslip, which are perfect for the invertebrates and um, it just looks lovely as well. This is On TV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. Some crimes are so public and so horrifically arbitrary that the shock reverberates far beyond the area where they took place. Like the dreadful events this morning that shattered the suburban calm of the streets where London borders Essex. Witnesses watched as a 14-year-old boy, apparently on his way to school, was suddenly attacked by a man wielding what looked like a sword and within seconds, the boy lay dying on the pavement. One woman who'd seen this horror told us how, moments earlier, the attacker drew his blade as he confronted her face to face, but she managed to get away. Two other people and two police officers were injured in the attacker's rampage before he was tasered to the ground. It is not thought to have been a targeted attack or indeed terror-related. A 36-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder. For 20 terrifying minutes, this quiet suburban street became a scene of unimaginable horror. Just before 7 a.m., as people inside these houses would have been waking up, outside was a man with a sword. By the time police arrested him, a 14-year-old boy had been killed. This is the moment they caught up with him after he jumped over a fence in his right hand, still carrying the sword. Two officers approached him, firing tasers. A few seconds later, he fell to the ground. This guy's got a sword. Moments earlier, the woman behind the camera had come face to face with the suspect. She says he was on the phone to the fire brigade, asking her for an address. Once I told the address, he sort of moved closer towards me. He put his foot on my foot so I couldn't back off. And then that's when he like drew out the sword. And it was, it was, it was arm's length. It was honestly petrifying. Um, I, just, I just ran. That's the, the first thing I could think of. So I just ran down the road. I didn't even look back to see if he was chasing me or anything. I do feel like I somewhat got a second chance at life today because he was very close to me and I, I feel if I hadn't ran straight away, he might have done something. She says she then tried to warn her neighbour who had just left his house for school. So at first I, my instinct was to just shout and wave at him, which is what me and um, another neighbour did. 
but because he had just put his headphones on, I don't think he heard either of us. And then it was sort it was sort of a moment where we just went from shouting to just just blankness, you know, just felt empty because someone's life just got taken right in front of us. Four other people hurt in the attack, including two police officers, are tonight being treated in hospital. Their injuries are not thought to be life-threatening. Police were called to Hainault in northeast London just before seven o'clock this morning after reports of a van crashed into a house near Thurlow Gardens, not far from Hainault tube station. Witnesses filmed the suspect walking along Langclose and Franklin Gardens carrying a sword before he was tasered and arrested, 22 minutes after the first call to police. I commend the incredible bravery of not just the police officers but the other emergency responders who came to this scene this morning. The events of this morning are truly horrific and I cannot even begin to imagine how those affected must be feeling. Their job now is working out why this happened and how a 14-year-old boy could have faced such mortal danger while he was simply on his way to school. And Chloe joins us now. Chloe, well, as the officer said there, a terrifying morning. But where are we with the police investigation tonight? Well, Tom, the police have had that 36-year-old man in their custody since first custody since first thing this morning. But in an update this afternoon, they said that because he was actually injured uh, when he crashed his van, he's now being treated for those injuries in hospital and they haven't actually been able to speak to him yet. They also addressed the fact that there has been speculation here today about whether that suspect was the same man that some people here have said they saw being arrested last night after he was seen carrying two knives. Now, the police say uh, they've been looking into this and that they have so far found uh, no evidence of any prior incident, in their own words, involving uh, that man. They do say they're not looking for anyone else. They don't believe this uh, to be terror-related and they don't believe there to be any sort of wider threat to this community but understandably people here want answers when i arrived here first thing this morning the people i spoke to were in a sense of deep shock and i think that shock has turned to sadness and anger with the news uh, that a 14 year old boy was killed a teenager after all who left his home this morning expecting to spend his day in school okay chloe that is deeply tragic but for now thank you the extraordinary possibility that Donald Trump could be put behind bars emerged tonight at his hush money trial in New York. The judge fined him for contempt for repeatedly violating an order banning him from making public statements about witnesses and jurors and others connected to the case. Nine such violations, in fact. Mr Trump took down the offending social media post just ahead of the judge's deadline. But the former president has also been warned in no uncertain terms that if he offends again... He'll go to prison. For the first time today, Donald Trump headed to court in the company of one of his own. Eric Trump joining the convoy to the former president's hush money trial. It wasn't long after they arrived that news broke Donald Trump had been fined for repeatedly breaching a gag order designed to stop him criticising witnesses, the jury or court staff. Today he lambasted one of the few people at court not protected by the restrictions. The judge should be re recused, and he should recuse himself today. It's the most recusable judge I've ever called recusal abuse, and he should recuse himself today. Maybe he will. Maybe he will. Maybe he'll do the right thing. But really, more importantly than the recusal, he should terminate the case today. The judge should terminate the case because they have no case. In a string of social media posts published this month, Donald Trump had hit out at witnesses like his former fixer Michael Cohen, calling him a serial perjurer. Today, Judge Juan Mershan ruled nine out of the ten posts were in contempt, fining Donald Trump the maximum penalty of $1,000 for each, warning if Donald Trump continued to break the order, jail may be a necessary punishment. Criminal contempt is a form of punishment. It's, it's not only to try to prevent the activity from occurring so the trial can proceed, but it's a form of punishment. And typically, contempt orders remain in place until the conduct ends or the trial ends. So one could expect the possibility that if he were incarcerated, he'd be in jail right until the very end of this trial and taken out every day, brought to court, 
brought back to jail at the end of the day, like many other individuals in the United States. That would be an extraordinary situation. It? it would be unheard of situation. Literally, we are on virgin territory here. Just before the judge's deadline, the offending social media posts were removed from Trump's Truth Social account and campaign website. For now, Donald Trump appears to have backed down. But on Thursday, the judge will hear prosecution claims the former president breached the gag order four more times during this case, testing the resolve and patience of this court once again. Dan joins us, as you can see. Dan, as this played out tonight, I did even wonder whether Mr Trump might actually think going to prison uh, would actually be quite good for his campaign. But he obviously has backed off in the end. What do you think, in the end, he makes of this ruling? Well, I suppose the calculation from his point of view would be, yes, if he did go to jail, it might fire up his base. But I think it would... Uh, pose some serious questions, to put it mildly, for those independent voters in the battleground states that are still weighing up their choice in this uh, presidential uh, election. Look, to be clear, Tom, the, the fine is water off a duck's back for a billionaire like Donald Trump. $9,000 is nothing. But the threat of jail is much, much more serious and would have to be weighed really uh, very heavily uh, for him and his lawyers. And I think you can see that because uh, so far, in all the comments he's made over the last few days, he is complying now with the order. He's stopped criticising people, uh, witnesses like Michael Cohen and, and Stormy Daniels. Uh, and as you mentioned, those social media posts which were deemed to be in breach of this gag order were taken down uh, this afternoon at the very last minute. They waited about half an hour before that deadline before they uh, decided uh, to take them down. So I think it's pretty unlikely that Donald Trump would deliberately now goad the judge into putting him into prison. The big unknown, of course, is you put Donald Trump in front of a microphone uh, and he has a tendency to shoot his mouth off. And, uh, you know, can he weigh his words carefully enough uh, for the next few weeks and stay out of trouble? Dan, it is endlessly fascinating. Thank you. Orphaned, injured, terrified. For thousands of the surviving children of Gaza, the horrors they must endure are at once agonising and bewildering. For a few of those that are very badly wounded, however, hope has emerged tonight in the trauma of their lives. A UK-based charity has managed to get some children out of Gaza to Cairo and there to put them on a flight to Italy to get the medical treatment they need. Rachel followed the story of little Ahmad. He's just three. His legs had to be amputated after the Israeli airstrike that killed his entire immediate family. His bravery and unbreakable spirit are remarkable. Nothing can prepare you for meeting three-year-old Ahmed. He handles his wheelchair like it's a dodgem, bursting with life despite having come so close to death. A boy with no legs, no parents, and no discernible fear of what's ahead. Travelling from Egypt to Italy on the first private rescue flight for Gaza's injured children. Until this moment, Ahmed's only experience of planes has been the roar of fighter jets, waging a war that began for him with Israel's very first airstrikes on Gaza. This is what's left of Ahmed's home hit in the early hours of October the 8th. They're digging frantically for his mum and dad, his big brother Mohammed, and his much-loved grandparents and cousins. But they're gone. After burying his sister and her family, Ahmed's uncle, Ibrahim, realized one of his nephews still hasn't been found. They said there was a child in another hospital, but we didn't know who it was. After my sister's funeral, I went to the Indonesian hospital, and it was Ahmed. It was my sister's son, and now he's my son. At this point, physically at least, Ahmed is still the child he was before the war. But the war isn't yet done with him. This is the aftermath of a huge blast in Nazirat. It's where Ibrahim and his younger brother Saleh took Ahmed to stay at a UN-run school because the Israelis said it was safe. But 26-year-old Saleh, who had just got engaged, is killed in the airstrike, his little nephew by his side. 
and Ahmed is unrecognisable, his pain unbearable. It's almost a month before he can be moved across the border to Egypt, Ibrahim leaving his own family behind in Rafa to be with a boy who desperately needs him. He says, I don't want fake legs, I want my legs back. Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night for no reason. I guess he's thinking back to losing his family or his legs or the terrible things he has seen. Ahmed seen things no child should see. Exhausted by a day of travel, who would want to picture the images that haunt their dreams? Children whose minds are as scarred as their bodies, but who still say thank you for every act of kindness and delight at the sight of the new country ahead of them. It's harder for the adults who are travelling with them, just one per child, far more aware of what's left behind. It's difficult to leave Gaza for me because my husband, I and my child are in Gaza. But for Amir's treatment, you yeah. need to go. Uh, you, uh, I need to go. The separations feel endless. While Ahmed has started to call Ibrahim Baba, his real dad will never celebrate another one of his birthdays nor witness the courage of a boy refusing to bow to the hand he's been dealt. Given their injuries, it's impossible to call any of these children lucky, but they are at least safe. And for Sally, whose charity Save a Child has worked tirelessly to get them out, the relief is immense. They're the most amazingly resilient children. With all those injuries, all really sick, and yet they're smiling, laughing, playing. Really, they're incredible children. I'm so happy that they're safe. By two in the morning, it's finally the end of their journey. But so many children just like them remain trapped in Gaza. The aid agencies are using a new acronym, WCNSF, or Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Five words and one little boy that sum up seven months of horror. Rachel Younger, News at 10, Trieste. Well, as people witness haunting scenes such as those, the wave of pro-Palestinian student protests continues to grip campuses across America. Protesters at Columbia University in New York occupied a key building on the main campus while the university authorities started suspending students taking part. And there were other campus flashpoints across America with protesters arrested in clashes with police in places like Austin, Texas. <laughs> taking matters into their own hands. It's what protesters against Israel's war in Gaza vowed to do. And then they did it, as they eventually took over a building at Columbia University in New York, changing its name to Hins Hall in tribute to a six-year-old Palestinian girl who died alone, separated from her family, killed by Israeli soldiers. A tragedy that strengthened resolve among these students. They will not be moved. We demand divestment. We will not be moved unless by force. It was force that riot police opted for at the University of Texas. Tough tactics and pepper spray were used to clear a small encampment of demonstrators. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Resistance was futile, but the actions of the authorities are supercharging student spirit to carry on. And inflaming political debate, prompting the Speaker of the House to call for President Biden himself to respond. We desperately need, the country needs clear moral authority. We need the President of the United States to speak to the issue and say this is wrong. What's happening on college campuses right now is wrong, it is un-American, it is not who we are. The president seems unable or unwilling to do that. These escalating demonstrations and the rhetoric surrounding them are too a concern for the United Nations. It is clear that there have been statements made uh, that could amount to anti-Semitism um, and also statements made that could amount to anti-Arab, um, anti-Palestinian hate speech. And these issues, um, these individual acts need to be addressed. I mean, they're reprehensible. But the actions of a small group do not render an entire protest illegal. Yes! 
It is one of the most significant student protest movements the U.S. has seen since the late 1960s. Angry mobs attempted to paralyze... The anti-war sentiment and the occupation of buildings echoing a Vietnam era. Then, like now, these are not sights to be ignored, nor are they feelings easily suppressed. Lucy Watson, News at 10. Well, for the seventh time since the war in Gaza began, America's top diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, is in Israel tonight. He's hoping to bolster negotiations so that both sides can agree to a ceasefire. But hours before Mr Blinken's arrival, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned there would be an incursion into the southern city of Rafah with or without a ceasefire deal. Israel regards Rafa as the last major stronghold of Hamas. It's also the last refuge for more than a million people sheltering from the war. Back here, it is understood tonight that the first migrant has been sent from the UK to Rwanda. The controversial Rwanda scheme to stop the small boats crossing the channel is, of course, one of Rishi Sunak's five key pledges. We understand the person is a failed asylum seeker, so not the main target of the scheme, and it was a voluntary removal for which the person would have been paid. Here, the big question tonight concerning who will be the next leader of the SNP is, will it be a competition or a coronation? Former Deputy First Minister John Swinney and former Finance Secretary Kate Forbes both have strong support. But there is also a groundswell of feeling that wants to avoid a contest which could further divide the party. And Louise is in Glasgow. Louise, uh, this is intriguing. What's your feeling about which way this will fall? It's a tricky one, Tom. I've spoken to lots of people today. John Swinney seems like the safe bet to go it alone, eradicating that toxic leadership battle. He already has current cabinet members and the SNP Westminster leader supporting his potential bid. He would also be able to get the Scottish Greens back on board, important in a minority government, of course, if you're wanting to pass bills and legislation. But he didn't stand in the leadership battle last year, partly for personal reasons, but also because he said it was time for fresh blood. And we've seen how a continuity candidate has fared. If you are wanting change within the party, which many members are, then Kate Forbes would be your answer. But her socially conservative views are not favoured by the Greens, so she would need to get MSPs from Scottish Labour or Scottish Conservatives on board to help her pass any bills and legislation. And when we're running up for a general election, it seems difficult to understand why either party would want to support the SNP and make it easy for them in any way. And both of those opposition parties are tomorrow supporting a no-confidence vote in the government. Kate Forbes told us today that she wants to do what is in the best interest for the party. She may be told that that is biding her time. The opposition parties already have plenty ammunition on the SNP. A leadership battle would only amplify that. OK, Louise, thank you very much indeed. Well, two men have been charged over the felling of the famous Sycamore Gap tree next to Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. There was national... Outrage, you will recall, when the well-known landmark was found to have been chopped down last September. Daniel Graham, who's 38, and 31-year-old Adam Carruthers have been charged with causing criminal damage and will appear in court next month. It might well be a moment to pause for thought, realising that the venue King Charles chose for his return to public life today was somewhere he could talk to fellow cancer patients. The King was always going to come under considerable scrutiny during his first public duty since his cancer diagnosis and his visit to the Macmillan Cancer Centre at one of London's major hospitals with Queen Camilla at his side seemed to pass off pretty well. It is something that the King has done many, many times in his life, but not once this year has he been able to do something as simple as this, a visit in a public place with members of the public. With his doctor's permission, it was a cancer centre he chose today to make the return of the King. Charles is also a cancer patient. In fact, in this chemotherapy ward, he told one patient he was going for his own treatment later in the day which meant he was asking how they were, and they asked the same of him. How are you? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, there's always been a bit of a shock. 
He listened intently to their stories. He had conversations about the side effects of chemo, including the loss of hair. And he grasped many of their hands as they parted. It was clear the king has a new and deeper empathy for cancer patients and what they're going through. Charles held my hand for quite a while and patted me on the shoulder. And I found myself also patting him. I asked him how he was and he said he's getting there. Yeah. So there was a connection because he knew what he knew. it feels like to be a patient and And you I understood know a bit of what he's been through. That he's going through something. Mm. Often the king spoke about early intervention. So the trouble is to get enough people early. Yeah. And raising awareness of cancer and its symptoms was, said royal sources, the main reason he has shared his own diagnosis. Appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. We need to get more people tested early. We all got to stick together. <laughs> Charles is already patron of Macmillan Cancer Support. Today he also took on that same role for Cancer Research UK. That sense of solidarity, uh, deep empathy and understanding and being open and transparent about his cancer is helping other people. He's been really keen that this is hopeful for people and I think what we've seen is people respond to a family who are going through what many of us have been through which is telling our children, telling our parents, telling our colleagues. Of course, it is the medics and family who provide the support, something Queen Camilla appeared to understand very well. And cancer affects the old and the young. Ellis is 11 and Della just six. Both are being treated here. When you get a diagnosis of, of cancer or like Della has with a brain tumour, I think there's a, there's a process and it's lovely that he's back and um, doing his normal duties. It will be down to the King's doctors to confirm any further engagements, but this was no routine visit for King Charles. It was personal. Chris Ship, News at 10, Central London. Finally, from the grandeur of aristocratic homes with their beautifully manicured grounds to the back gardens of suburbia, the well-mowed lawn has been a quintessentially British pride and joy since time immemorial. But perish the thought, perhaps the death knell for this summer institution is being sounded with something called No Mow May. Starting tomorrow, not mowing the lawn to billiard table smoothness is apparently better for bees, butterflies and other wildlife. Is there anything more quintessentially English to explore than a manicured National Trust garden accompanied by the sound of a springtime mower? But at Osterley House and Park, stripes are so last season. Mowers are being packed away in favour of a spot of nature. The main reason back in the day, we're talking hundreds of years ago, that you would have had mown lawns was that it was a status symbol, that they didn't have to have their land being productive. So it was just showing off? It was just showing off, basically. The stately homes of England, how beautiful they stand. To prove the upper classes have still the upper hand. This 60s film shot at Osterley was titled The Grass is Greener. But in reality, a mown lawn doesn't offer nature that much. In fact, since the 30s, we've lost 97% of our wild grass and flowers. You can see the contrast between how we used to mow it and how it is now mm. with the longer grass, the wilder flowers, things like this cowslip, which are perfect for the invertebrates, bees, butterflies, whatnot, and um, it just looks lovely as well. No Mo May isn't just for professionals. Charity Plant Life wants us all to give our gardens to nature for the month it needs it most. It's the time when the plants are really putting on that extra surge of growth. Just doing this little one thing in your garden could make a huge difference to the insects and other wildlife that use your garden. Perhaps surprisingly, the Lawn Association are in favour. Even without his robot mower, David's confident he can avoid knee-high July. There's never been a perfect lawn. Uh, there's been a perception of a perfect lawn having no weeds and so forth. But we've got to go back to using our native grasses then no, mow may is not a problem. Turning off the mower may seem like turning our backs on tradition, but environmentalists say this is how our green and pleasant land looks naturally. Martin Stew, News at 10. 
No mo May to knee high July. Now I've heard it all. That's it. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching.